All right. Are there any questions? Yeah, the exam I've started grading, but I'm not done yet. So probably by Tuesday, or for sure by Tuesday, I will have it back to you. Okay. So any questions from the last class? So we had already discussed, you know, the M phase promoting factor, right? Which is the cyclin, cyclin dependent kinase complex that drives cells into M phase. Okay. So in addition to that, there are many other varieties of cyclin. And in most eukaryotes, many varieties of cyclin-dependent kinases which are involved in cell cycle control. For example, you have S phase cyclins which will trigger the entry into the S phase. Okay, again, once again, what is the S phase? Anybody remember? DNA synthesis phase, yeah. Uh, while G1 cyclins act earlier in G1, all right? So G1 is the gap between M phase and S phase, okay? It's the gap, it, it's the first gap that allows the cell enough time to grow, okay? So if you're looking at G1 cyclins, which act earlier in G1, they bind to the cyclin-dependent kinase molecules to help initiate the formation and activation of the S phase cyclin CDK complexes, and thereby they will drive the cell towards S phase. Right? So it's basically a timing. You know, you have timers, individual timers, and then the, you know, the, once this one gets done, then the next one starts, and so on. Okay? So note that the concentration of each type of cyclin rises and then falls sharply at a specific time in the cell cycle. The fall is very, very sharp, okay? The rise is gradual, right? Because it takes time to build up the cycling concentration. And this gradual rise and then the fall in, in the concentration of the cycling, right? That controls the timing of that particular stage, right? And as before, that means as in the case of the M phase promoting factor, the fall in the cycling concentration is the result of cycling degradation by the ubiquitin pathway, right? Again, what was the ubiquitin? Anybody remember? Exactly, yeah. So basically it's like marking out trash, you know, that has to be recycled. Okay, good. Now, as we have already seen, right, the cell cycle control system triggers the events of the cell cycle in a specific order. Because you have to have M phase, followed by G1 phase, followed by S phase, followed by G2, and then by M phase, right? You remember that diagram, right? Now, if one of the steps is delayed, the control system of necessity must delay the activation of the following steps so that the sequence is maintained, right? If you don't finish DNA replication, you cannot go and do mitosis, right? right? So this is accomplished by the action of what are called molecular breaks that can stop the cell cycle at specific checkpoints. For most cases, the detailed molecular mechanisms that are involved in, in these checkpoints, right, in these arresting, they're not well understood. However, in some cases, it is known that specific cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor proteins, right, uh, come into play, right? So you have cyclin, you need cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinase for, to control the timing, right? So if you have proteins that will inhibit the cyclin-dependent kinases, then it will stop the cell cycle at that place, okay, and give more time for, for that activity, particular activity to be completed. Now, one of the best understood checkpoints stops the cell cycle in the G1 phase if the DNA is damaged, right? Remember I said earlier, right, in, in one of the earlier lectures, that any time you step out into the sun, right, you get some DNA damage, okay? What kind of DNA damage is that due to ultraviolet radiation? Th yeah, thymine dimers are formed, okay? So if, if DNA is damaged, right, the damaged DNA should not be replicated because then you're propagating the damage, right? So there has to be some mechanism for arresting the cell cycle, right? And so, so this particular mechanism is quite well understood. So DNA damage causes an increase in both the concentration and activity of a particular gene regulatory protein, which is called P53, right? And this is very widely talked about in the, in the biology and in the cancer literature, right? And P53 simply means P is for protein, right? And the molecular weight of that protein happens to be 53,000 Daltons, right? So P53 is protein with a molecular weight of 53,000 uh, units, right? So when P53, P53 is a transcription factor, right? Again, what is a transcription factor? Anybody remember? Like in, anybody, I mean, what is a transcription factor? See, see, again, I mean, if you've forgotten, that's fine, you know, but, you know, try to get all this under your, <coughs> under control before the next exam, right? Transcription factors, if you remember that when you're looking at eukaryotic transcription, right? 
it's not enough to just have an RNA polymerase over there or right? just one activator. There are a lot of different things that have to, have to come and assemble to get the whole thing started, okay? So and each of those factors is called a transcription factor. So P53 is an example of a transcription factor, right? So when it is activated, P53 is going to stimulate the transcription of, of several genes, okay? But one of the genes is one which encodes a cyclin dependent, uh, dependent kinase inhibitor protein, which is called P21, right? Or it's sometimes also called WAF, W-A-F, P21. Again, P21 is basically protein with a molecular weight of 21,000 units, right? Now, so, so when P53 stimulates the transcription of P21, right? That means P21 is going to get transcribed into P21 messenger RNA. That is going to get translated into P21 protein, right? So the concentration of P21 protein will go up, right? And this P21 protein then binds to the S phase cyclin CDK complex. Again, cyclin, cyclin-dependent kinase complex, which is responsible for driving the cell into S phase, okay? And this binding by P21 is going to block the action. So it is not going to move into S phase, right? So this is going to allow the cell enough time to repair the DNA, right? right? The, the DNA damage before the, uh, the DNA is replicated. So the arrest of the cell cycle in G1 allows the cell time to repair the damaged DNA before replicating it, okay? So this is referred to as G1 arrest, okay? As I said last time, G1 arrest doesn't have anything to do with arresting somebody in the Brazos County jail, right, and sending them to jail. It's basically stopping the cell cycle at a particular region. Right. Now, what happens if P53 is missing or defective? Right? If somebody has a mutation in the P53 gene, then the essential function is not going to be performed. Right? So if P53 is missing or defective, the unrestrained replication of damaged DNA leads to a high rate of mutation because the damage is going to propagate. Every time the cell div divides, you know, damaged DNA is going to be propagated. Right? And the production of cells that tend to become cancerous. Right? And I, I will explain, you know, by the time I get to the end of this lecture, Right, how the cell can become cancerous because, uh, as a consequence of uh, damaged DNA. In fact, mutations in the P53 gene, which permit cells with dam damaged DNA to proliferate, play an important part in the development of many human cancers. In fact, if you look at, if you do the analysis of many of the, of the human cancers, like you take a biopsy and then you analyze that, you'll see that the P53 gene is mutated in many cases. Right. All right, any questions? Now, all cells don't have to keep on, you know, undergoing the cell cycle all the time, right? That means M phase followed by G1, then followed by S, followed by G2, again M, right? So you can have a situation where the cell cycle control system machinery is dismantled and the cell is arrested somewhere, right? So cells can dismantle their control system and withdraw from the cell cycle altogether. In the human body, for example, the nerve cells have to persist for a lifetime without dividing, right? And that is the reason why if you have like a spinal injury or something like that, you're paralyzed, right, with today's technology, right? Because we don't know how to regenerate those, those nerve cells, right? So consequently, cells of this type will enter a modified G1 state, which is called G0, right? In which the cell cycle control system is partly dismantled, in that many of the cyclin-dependent kinases and cyclins disappear, right? So if those things disappear, you're not going to have the cycle continuing, right? So as a result, the nerve cell remains permanently in the G0 state, okay? Now, mammalian cells, right? We are all mammals, right? So mammalian cells, they proliferate only if they are stimulated to do so by signals from other cells, right? So if, de if deprived of such signals, right? If, if there are other cells that are not telling it to divide, right? Then the cell cycle will just rest at a G1 checkpoint, right? And it will enter the G0 phase, right? It's not going to divide anymore. Now, how are the cell numbers in a multicellular organism controlled, right? Now, if you look at bacteria and yeast, right, these are unicellular organisms, right? So they will just keep on dividing. If you give them enough food and the ambient conditions are right, they just keep on dividing, right? However, for an animal cell, an animal is like a multicellular organism, right? For an animal cell to proliferate, just giving it food is not enough, right? It must also receive stimulating signals from other cells, usually its neighbors, right? In other words, in multicellular organisms, cell division is under very tight control, right? See, like once you're an adult, right, you don't see, you know, your body changing, right? You don't start growing new organs and things like that, right? If you start doing that, that means probably you have a disease, right? Under normal circumstances, that's not going to happen. Right. Now, an important example of a break 
on cell division that holds uh, that keeps cell proliferation in check is what is called the retinoblastoma protein right or rv protein all right retinoblastoma i mean you can guess from the name you know it's, it's retinoblastoma it's some kind of cancer right it's basically a cancer in the eye right and uh, people who are born with uh, a defect in their gene they develop tumors in the eyes okay and they are usually you know uh, th those tumors probably kill them by the time they're two years old right so that's why it's called the retinoblastoma uh, gene right or, or the retinoblastoma protein the retinoblastoma protein which is abundant in the nucleus of all vertebrate cells that means all organisms that have backbones right like us all right it binds to particular gene regulatory proteins preventing them from stimulating the transcription of genes required for cell proliferation right so the retinoblastoma protein is like a break on cell proliferation it is preventing the transcription of genes that are needed for the cell to proliferate right however when there is a need for the cell to proliferate right these breaks are going to be released right and then the cell will proliferate okay so and when is that going to happen extracellular signals such as growth factors right a growth factor or a mitogen is something that is going to cause the cell to divide okay now if you look at a cell right uh, on the membrane of the cell right you have what are called receptors okay which are transmembrane proteins they're linking the outside of the cell to the inside right so you will have a growth factor receptor on the on the cell membrane right if a growth factor comes and binds the growth factor receptor that will sell, send a signal inside the cell that hey it's time to divide right and one of the ways in which it is do, it's going to do that is it's, go, it's going to remove that retinoblastoma break right so extracellular signals such as growth factors which stimulate cell proliferation lead to the activation of the g1 cyclin cyclin dependent kinase complex, uh, complexes mentioned earlier right now these the, com the g1 cyclin cdk complex is going to go and phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein right remember i i talked about this in the chapter on proteins okay when you phosphorylate a, a particular protein you add a phosphate group you have added two negative charges it's going to change the shape of the protein okay it's going to alter its function it could turn it on off okay depending on on what it was supposed to do so these these guys these g1 cyclin cdk complexes they will phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein changing its conformation so that it it releases its its grip on those gene regulatory proteins that it is inhibiting all right which are then free to activate the genes required for cell proliferation to proceed okay and the stimulating signals that act to override the breaks on cell proliferation are mostly protein growth factors right so one example of a and, and there are lots of examples right uh, one example of a protein growth factor is the so called platelet derived growth factor of pdgf right now when blood clots in a wound for example right blood platelets that are incorporated into the clot they are triggered to release this platelet derived growth factor right so if this platelet derived growth factor goes and binds the platelet platelet derived growth factor receptor on neighboring cells okay it is going to stimulate those cells to divide right so they will bind to the receptor is called a receptor tyrosine kinase anybody remember what is it what was tyrosine anybody no 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 it's one of the amino acids okay there are 20 amino acids i didn't force you to memorize all the names tyrosine is one of them all right and usually these receptors they have this tyrosine kinase right so so when uh, the platelet derived growth factor comes and binds the receptor tyrosine kinase on the cell membrane right it's a kinase because it is going to add phosphate to something inside the cell right and it is going to get those reactions started for the cell to cell to proliferate so they bind to the receptor tyrosine kinases in surviving cells at the wound site thereby stimulating them to proliferate and heal the wound right see because normally in multicellular organisms you know there is a dynamic equilibrium between cell proliferation and cell death right but in situations like this where there is a wound that needs to heal right or you've had a surgery or something that needs to heal you need to turn up cell proliferation right and that can be done using these growth factors another example of a protein growth factor is what is called the hepatocyte growth factor right that is going to stimulate liver cells to divide right so in this case if part of the liver is lost through surgery or acute injury cells in the liver and elsewhere will produce this protein which is called the hepatocyte growth factor right which helps to stimulate the surviving liver cells to proliferate again i mean there'll be some membrane on the liver cell all right so uh, sorry not membrane there'll be a receptor uh, that is bound to the membrane right So this growth factor will come and bind it it's going to stimulate the 
liver cell to divide and you know basically restore the liver to its original size. Now, even in the presence of these growth factors, right? So the growth factors are like the stimulators of cell uh, cell division, right? So even in the presence of growth factors, normal animal cells do not keep on dividing indefinitely in culture, right? That means you have extracted the the cell uh, from an animal, right? And you've cultured it, and you you're giving it nutrients under right conditions, right? And the growth factors, even then, the cell will not keep on dividing indefinitely. It'll stop after a certain number of divisions, right? So even cell types which maintain the ability to div divide throughout the lifetime of the animal, they have stopped dividing after a limited number of divisions, right? For example, fibroblasts, which is a class of cells from which connective tissue is derived, right? Um, like, uh, for example, muscle and all that is derived, right? So taken from a human fetus, they will stop dividing after 80 rounds of cell division, right? While fibroblasts that are taken from a 40-year-old adult, they stop dividing after 40 rounds of cell division, right? So it looks like, you know, the cells are also growing old, right? It's not that we as individuals are growing older, even the cells are growing old, and they're keeping some track of that, you know. So this phenomenon is known as cell senescence, right? And we will talk about this. when we In, in the case of plant biology, there is a chapter that is devoted to plant senescence, right? So I will talk about that later, right? On the other hand, if you take fibroblasts, the same type of cells from a mouse embryo, right? they hold their proliferation after only about 30 divisions in culture, right? So this may partly explain why mice are so small compared to us, okay? because the number of cell divisions, right, that each cell undergoes is a lot smaller, right, over the lifetime of the organism. Now the mechanisms that halt the cell cycle in either developing or aging cells are not clearly understood at the present time, although the accumulation of cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor proteins and the loss of cyclin-dependent kinases are likely to be involved. Because we know that these are the things that basically control the cell cycle. All right, any questions? Now, in addition to needing growth factors to divide, right, animal cells also require signals from other cells to avoid what is called programmed cell death or apoptosis, right? And these signals are called survival factors. If de deprived of such survival factors, the cells can activate an intracellular suicide program and die by a process which is called programmed cell death or apoptosis, right? Now, you might wonder, you know, what use is cell death, okay? Cell death is, is good. So, suppose you have infected cells, okay? It's better that those die, right, instead of propagate, right? So, it, it's something like this, that in a multicellular organism, you know, some of the cells might choose to die for the overall well-being of the organism. Overall, like we humans are made up of 100 trillion cells, okay? If you have a few hundred cells that are in bad shape, right, it's better that they die instead of messing up the whole organism, right? So this apoptosis, programmed cell death or apoptosis, helps ensure that cells survive only when and where they are needed, right? And in fact, the amount of programmed cell death or apoptosis that occurs in both developing and adult tissues is really amazing, right? Uh, for example, in the developing vertebrate nervous system, more than half of the nerve cells normally die soon after they are formed, right? And there is a reason for that because, you know, if, you, if you're forming the nervous system, that is like a communication network, all right? It's like a network. So if you have something that is broadcasting, you have the need the right number of receptors. You know, there might be, you know, there might be extra cells that have been produced, right, that don't need to be put in anywhere in that network, right? And so they will be gone right. by apoptosis. Now, if you look at a healthy uh, adult human, billions of cells are dying in the intestine every hour, right? So as I said, you know, once every three days, there's a turnover, right? So billions of cells are dying in the intestine. And a natural question that arises is what purpose is served by this huge amount of cell death? In some cases, the answers are clear, right? But not in all cases, right? For example, the sculpting of hands and feet in mammals, right? Because you're your fingers and all are initially not sculpted, okay? So it's just like one, one big mass, okay? So, uh, you know, the fingers and all, they're basically called, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, they come into, into, into play, all right? By the death of the cells that are, let's say, link, linking your fingers, okay? And it's going to be programmed cell death or apoptosis, right? This kind of cell death is different from the kind of cell death that you have, okay? If you have a cut or wound, or you got an infection, okay? That's an inflammatory response. That is called necrosis, right? That is a messy thing. This one is neat, right? You'd, or another example is uh, the tail of a tadpole shrinking, right? 
It's not like just going and, you know, chopping off the tail of the tadpole, okay? That's going to cause an inflammatory response, all right? Apoptosis is different, right? The organism is not even going to realize because the cells will just kill themselves. They will not mess up their neighbors, right? So in, the, so in case, some cases, the answers are clear, like the sculpting of hands and feet in mammals or the developmental loss of the tail of a tadpole are brought about by apoptosis, right? Uh, in the case of the developing vertebrate nervous system also, apoptosis is used to match the number of nerve cells to the number of target cells that require innervation, right? Because this is like a communication network, right? Signal is traveling from point A to point B. You don't need extra nodes over there, right? In yet another case, an enlarged liver can be returned to normal size via apoptosis, right? Not by going and chopping off, the, off part of the liver, right? But if you can induce apoptosis, you can re re return it to normal size. So we next discuss how apoptosis uniquely differs from other kinds of cell death, right? Mainly cell necrosis. Now cells which die as a result of acute injury typically will swell and burst and spill their contents all over their neighbors a process which is called necrosis, right? You have like pus forming, all kinds of things happening, right? And this causes a potentially damaging inflammatory response. By contrast, a cell which undergoes apoptosis is going to die very neatly without damaging its neighbors, right? The cell shrinks and condenses. The cytoskeleton, again, what is the cytoskeleton? Yeah, it's a, it's a kind of skeletal structure inside the cell made up of microtubules and so on, okay? So the cell shrinks and condenses, the cytoskeleton collapses, the nuclear envelope disassembles, and the nuclear DNA breaks up into fragments, right? And most important, the cell surface is altered, right? So I, this is a dying cell, something is changing on the cell surface, so it makes it easier for trash cleaners to come and clean up that cell, right? So the cell surface is altered, displaying properties that cause the dying cell to be cleaned up immediately, either by its neighbors, or by a macrophage before there is any leakage of its contents. So it, it dies a very, very neat death, right, in apoptosis. Any questions? Now the machinery that is responsible for this kind of uh, control cell suicide seems to be similar in all animal cells, right? It involves a family of proteases. Again, what are proteases? What? Yes, proteases break, are enzymes, okay? They are all enzymes. Enzymes means they are proteins, which work as catalysts, okay? So proteases are enzymes that break down proteins. So it involves a family of proteases which are themselves activated by proteolytic cleavage, right? Again, there's some other protease that is activating them, right? In response to signals that induce programmed cell death. And then the activated suicide proteases cleave, that means cut up, and thereby activate other members of the family resulting in an amplifying proteolytic cascade, which is often referred to as an apoptotic cascade, right? Because once it gets started, it's like everything falls apart pretty quickly and then the cell dies. So the activated proteases then cleave other key proteins in the cell, killing it quickly and neatly, okay? The key thing is that it's a neat cell death, right? It's not like, you know, you die, you mess up everybody else in, in the surrounding, okay? That is necrosis. Okay, any questions so far? Of course, yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, like one of the ways you try to treat cancer is try to kill the cancer cell, okay? And you, yeah, by giving growth factors, you can uh, stimulate the cell to divide, yes. You can do that. People do that in the lab all the time. Okay, so next we move on to cancer. You've already gotten, you know, some glimpses of it, right? But now we'll do a full-blown a treatment of cancer. And again, this doesn't substitute what an oncologist is going to do because they're spending their whole life, right? And I cannot do it in like in uh, like half a lecture or something like that, right? But you'll get the big picture. We do not need, right? The thing is, in order to work in this area, right, in uh, cancer genomics or even in plant genomics, right, I don't have to become a plant biologist or you don't have to become a cancer biologist or an oncologist, right? But the more you know, the better off you'll be, you know, because you need the domain knowledge. It's just like if I'm a controls person that does double E controls, all right? So I'm doing all the theory, right? If I'm going to work in aerospace applications, it's better for me to have some domain knowledge about aircraft and things like that, right? Otherwise, I'll be just working on something on paper that really and, and truly is not going to make much of an impact or a difference, right? And I won't even know what, how to pick 
the problems that are going to be, uh, whose solutions are going to be really impactful, will make a real difference, right? So, so it's good to have the big picture, right? And that's what I'm trying to do in this class. Hopefully, you know, through self-study, you will build up some more, right? Now, what is cancer, right? Well, cancer is, a, is actually an umbrella term for a large number of diseases that is caused by the breakdown of the cell cycle control system, right? So, I mean, those of you that are familiar with the controls area, we define stability, okay? That can happen only in one way. If it's a linear time invariant system, all the poles have to be in the left half plane, right? System has to be well-behaved, eigenvalues have to be in the left half plane. That's it. But if you're talking about instability or breakdowns, okay, it can happen in many different ways, okay? So, it, so you know, uh, get that straight that uh, in, in your minds that cancer is, is really an umbrella term for many diseases. No two cancers are the same, right? So that's what makes the treatment even more challenging. So cancers are the product of mutations which set cells free from the usual controls on cell proliferation and survival, right? A cell in the body mutates through a series of chance events, right? And we know how, I, I've talked about genetic variation, right? I've talked about, you know, stepping out in the sun, getting your DNA damaged and all that. So over a lifetime, mutations are going to accumulate, right? If you smoke, again, I mean, like, th those are carcinogens, they are going to, there are going to be mutations, right? in your cells, in the lungs, and so on, okay? So a cell in the body mutates through a series of chance events, and it acquires the ability to proliferate without the normal restraints, okay? That's the problem, right? So the progeny of that cell will inherit those mutations, and they'll give rise to a tumor that can grow without limit. Because this has acquired the ability, this cell, through a series of mutations, it has acquired the ability to keep on multiplying, right? Because normally the cell is going to multiply when it's stimulated by growth factors, all right? So now because, let's say the platelet-derived growth factor is mutated, right? Which means that even if there's no growth factor coming in binding, it's signaling inside, right? To the cell, divide, divide, divide. So there's going to be uncontrollable cell division, right? Now, oncogenes, which turn on cell division, and tumor suppressor genes, which function as brakes on cell division, play an important role in causing cancer, right? So oncogene is a name for a, for a cancer-causing gene, right? So an example of an oncogene, see the original gene is not an oncogene. The platelet-derived growth factor gene is not an oncogene because it responds only to the right stimulus, right? So, if, so uh, like if you have platelets that are released, right, then, you know, uh, they will produce platelet-derived growth factor, right? Then uh, th those will bind to the receptor tyrosine kinases and call, cause the cell to divide, right? So this is not an oncogene, right? So it, it's in fact called... Uh, Proto-oncogene, right? Proto means before, before being an oncogene. It'll become an oncogene when it mutates and it starts, you know, cell proliferation, even in the absence of the stimulus, right? So an example of an oncogene is a gene produced from the gene for the platelet-derived growth factor, right? PDGF. So here the normal platelet-derived growth factor gene is called a proto-oncogene, right? And the corresponding cancer-causing gene is called an oncogene, right? Remember, we talked about uh, the Rouse sarcoma virus, if you remember, right, that causes uh, cancer in chickens, right? We talked about that virus, how, how the virus could cause cancer, and it was going to pick up a gene called SRC, right, which is involved in the control of cell division. The normal SRC is a proto-oncogene, right? But through this process of genetic variation, right, that thing is mutated, right? And the difference is what gives it the ability to cause the cancer in those animals, right? So while the proto-oncogene stimulates cell proliferation when more cells are needed, the oncogene causes cell proliferation even when no new cells are needed, right? So an example of an onco oncogene is the gene that is derived from the platelet-derived growth factor, right? Or uh, the, the proto-oncogene in this case is the platelet-derived growth factor. An example of a tumor suppressor gene would be a break on cell division, and we talked about a break on cell division today. That's the retinoblastoma gene, right? So an example of a tumor suppressor gene is the retinoblastoma gene whose product normally acts as a break on cell division. And I tried to explain to you how that controls all those cyclin-dependent kinases and things like that, right? So when this gene is mutated, when this retinoblastoma gene is mutated, then the break on cell division is gone, right? And the cell keeps on dividing, forming tumors, and, you know, ultimately those become ag aggressive or invasive tumors, right, or cancers, leading to the cancer that is called retinoblastoma. So when this gene is mutated, the breaking action may no longer be pre present, leading to excessive cell proliferation. Now, if you so we are all diploid organisms, right? What does that mean? If you're diploid, 
means you have two copies of each gene, right? One from each parent, right? So in a normal diploid cell, there are two copies of each gene in the genome, right? Now, since a proto-oncogene is like an accelerator, right? It accelerates cell division when called upon to do so. Only one copy of that proto-oncogene needs to be mutated to an oncogene, right? And then you have full-blown cancer, right? Before excessive cell proliferation and possibly cancer can result. Because just like in a car, you have two brakes, okay? Both the brakes have to fail, right, for you to crash, right? But if the accelerator gets stuck, you're finished, right? And it has happened with some cars, it has happened, right? I mean, maybe it's with a Prius. I don't remember which car it was, but there have been lawsuits and all that, okay? In this country, it does happen because you push on the gas and then it keeps on accelerating, right? I mean, you cannot, then there's an accident. So on the other hand, so if, if it's a, a proto-oncogene, only one copy getting mutated is going to mess you up, all right? But if it's a tumor suppressor gene that is associated with br the breaking action on cell division, both copies will have to be mutated before a loss of function possibly leading to cancer can occur, right? Now, in almost all adult tissues, Cells are continually dying and being replaced. As I said, you know, cells on your skin, every 10 days you have new skin, right? Believe it or not, right? Uh, then um, in your gut, every three days, right? So now through all the hurly-burly of cell replacement and tissue renewal, the architecture of the tissue must be maintained, right? Like we don't keep, like every 10 days we don't see a new person, right? It's the same person, right? I mean, maybe 10 years it might, it might look different, okay, 10 or 20 years, all right? So the, the tissue architecture has to be maintained, right? So how is that done? So there is some kind of a dynamic equilibrium between cell proliferation and apoptosis, right? Because apoptosis is what is reducing, uh, what is removing the c cells, let's say, from your gut, right? Once every three days, all right? So three main factors contribute to making this possible, that is maintenance of tissue architecture. Number one is cell communication. Cells communicate with each other, right? Long before man invented communication and on the cell phones, the cells have to communicate, right? So this ensures that new cells are produced only when and where they are required, right? Then the second thing is there is selective cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. The selectivity of adhesion prevents the different cell types in a tissue from becoming chaotically mixed, right? Because you don't, like, if it's liver tissue, it, it should be only liver, okay? Or if, they, if there are some, you know, some blood vessels and all, they are of a different type, you know, so that kind of, that architecture has to be preserved. And then the third thing that helps in the maintenance of tissue architecture is the memory in cells, right? Cells autonomously preserve their distinctive character and pass it on to their progeny, right? And we have seen that, you know, like a cell might be, uh, might cause the tra transcription of its own, own protein, right? So that way the characteristic is preserved, right? So this preserves the diversity of cell types in the tissue. Now, different tissues in the body are renewed at different rates, right? For example, the nerve cells in, a, in the body never divide because they have to last a lifetime without dividing, right? While liver cells divide about once a year, right? The cells lining the inside of the gut, on the other hand, are turned over once every three days. On your skin, once every 10 days. Now, many of the differentiated cell, cells that need continual replacement are themselves unable to dis divide. And more of such cells are generated from a stock of precursor cells, which are called stem cells, right? That are retained in the corresponding tissues along with the differentiated cells. So anytime more cells are needed, you're basically going to tap into the stem cells, right? Now, stem cells can divide without limit. Some of the progeny of the stem cells will remain stem cells, right? While others will embark on a course leading irreversibly to terminal differentiation. Now, in the context of cancer, we also have to talk about this term that is called metastasis, right? And, and that's what in everyday language is, called, uh, is referred to as the spreading of cancer. You hear about cancer spreading, right? So what defines cancer cells? So cancer cells are defined by two heritable properties. That means they can pass this property onto their progeny, right? They and their progeny can, number one, produce, reproduce in defiance of the normal social, social constraints, right? And number two, they can invade and colonize territory it's normally reserved for other cells, right? Cells which have only property number one right, will result in what is called a benign tumor. So if cell division is turned on, right, other tissue is not being invaded, right, you have what is called a benign tumor, so you can cut that tumor and remove it, right, and you're done, right? You, the ch your chances of getting cancer are no more than what it was before, right? So the benign tumor, it can be removed cleanly, and it's gone, 
right? But if you leave that tumor, there is a chance that it'll it'll become cancerous. Why? Because to sustain that tumor, the cell proliferation is turned on. Every time the cell divides, there's some DNA damage that is getting propagated. If you keep on doing it too many times, chances are at some point in time you will activate some on oncogene, right? Or deactivate some tumor suppressor, and you know, and and cancer will result. Right? So cells which have only property one, they result in a benign tumor, while cells which have properties one and two will result in a malignant tumor, which is a cancer. Right? Now malignant tumor cells can break loose from the primary tumor. They could enter the bloodstream or lymphatic vessels. Okay. Once they do that, they can basically go anywhere in the body. Right? And they can form secondary tumors or what is, what is referred to as metastases at other sites in the body. Right? And this is refer, referred to as the spreading of cancer. And this is usually what kills the, the organism. Right? Because it's all over the place now. Now it is important, or right, any questions so far? Now it is important to note that cancer is a consequence of mutation and natural selection within the population of cells that form the body. Indeed, the mutations in cancer cells give them a competitive advantage over their normal neighbors because, because they can do things that their normal neighbors cannot. Okay, so they're going to eat up all the resources. Right? So unfortunately, it is this very fact, this, this competitive advantage for the cancer cell that leads to disaster for the multicellular organism. Since the controls on cell proliferation and survival, which are at the heart of maintaining tissue architecture, are disrupted. Right? Now about 10 to the power of 16, cell divisions take place in the human body over the lifetime of an individual, right? And based on this, it can be shown, okay, I have not checked the detailed calculations, okay? I don't know where it, it's been carried out, right? You can look in the literature. It can be shown that every single gene in the genome is likely to have undergone mutations on about 10 to the power of 10 separate occasions in any individual human being, right? However, you don't keep on getting cancer all the time, right? I mean. So typically, you need five or six independent mutations must occur in one cell to make it cancerous. This is because the body of a multicellular organism has got different levels of protection against cancer. There are a lot of redundancies, right? Maybe one pathway has been messed up, right? But then something else kicks in, right? And it's going to prevent the cell from turn, turning cancerous, right? For example, to become cancerous, a lot of bad things have to happen. An epithelial stem cell, epithelial means on, on the skin, okay? So an epithelial stem cell in the skin or the lining of the gut, it must undergo changes that not only enable it to divide more frequently than it should, but also let its progeny escape being sloughed off in the normal way from the exposed surface of the epithelium. Because as I said, you know, cells on the skin are replaced once every 10 days, right, in the gut. So even if there is a cell that has be, uh, is trying to become cancerous, okay, chances are that it'll get sloughed off, right? Then in addition to that, the cell, cell to become cancer, uh, completely cancerous and stick on there, right? it has to be able to displace its normal neighbors, right? And it also has to attract a blood supply sufficient to nourish tumor growth. Because for the cell to grow, right, it is going to need nutrients, right? And that has to be supplied by the blood, right? So that's why in, in cancer, uh, you have the development of new blood vessels, okay? That is referred to as angiogenesis, right? New blood vessels are born because the tumor has to be supplied with nutrients. Right? So one way to try to kill the cancer would be to cut off that blood supply. Right? There, there, there are different kinds of things that you can try, but usually, you know, the cancer cell is also quite intelligent. You try to do something, right? It's going to f find out a way to bypass whatever hurdle you're putting in its path. Right? And one reason for that is like one of my colleagues was telling me, you know, that uh, the cancer the the cancer cell has evolved over maybe billions of years, okay? So, and whereas our cancer drugs are just maybe 60 years old, right? So it's, it's going to adapt faster than we can keep up pace with. So that's the mutations that which give rise to a ca a cancer accumulate over a long p time, right? Because, you know, it's like one or two mutations will not do it. You have to have a number of independent mutations, all right? In one single cell, like five or six independent mutations before the cell will become cancerous. Sorry. So it takes time to build up those mutations, right? And that's why cancer is typically a disease of old age, right? So, and the, and I have heard people say that that if you live long enough, right, if you don't die of anything else, you'll die of cancer, right? So you, yeah, because we don't we take it for granted, okay? I mean, like the cell cell cycle control and all that stuff, you know. But at some point in time, it will mess up, you know. So.
And the older you are, the more higher your chances. Now, occasionally, however, individuals are encountered who have inherited a germline mutation, right? That means whatever genes they got from their parents, right? They have inherited a mutation, let's say, in a tumor suppressor gene or in an oncogene. You have two copies of that gene. If one is already messed up, all right? Guess what? Okay, it'll take much fewer mutations for the other one to get messed up and for you to get full-blown cancer. So for these people, unfortunately, the number of mutations needed is less and the disease occurs more frequently at an earlier age. And the families that carry such mutations are therefore prone to cancer. Right? For example, there was a guy that one year junior to me in undergrad school. Right? And while we were in undergrad school, I mean, and this is in the 80s, his dad uh, was suddenly diagnosed with colon cancer, right? and he passed away. Right? Then this guy actually came to this country, and he, he was, I think he did his PhD at Rice University. I don't know whether he could finish it or not in chemical engineering. So, you know, several years ago, we heard that uh, he, had, he also got colon cancer, right? And he died. And he was probably in his, uh, I would think he probably in his 20s, right? And then at that time, they did a test on his brother, okay? Because his father had died of colon cancer, and uh, he had died of colon cancer. So they did a test on his elder brother and found that uh, in his colon, he had polyps, you know, which, which would become cancerous. So these things do run uh, in families, you know, so. So if you have a family history of that, and, and that's treatable, the colon cancer and all that, you know, it's basically some growths in the colon. They can do a colonoscopy, right? They can take it out, right? And normally they do it in people that are over 50 because your chances are higher. You have to do it every 10 years. But, uh, you know, your life can be saved, right? So if, if anybody has a history of that, you know, it's better to, you know, talk to your doctor and get yourself screened, you know, before. Uh, because as long as it is contained inside the colon, they can go and take it out, right? And, uh, and, and you're fine, okay? They have to check every two years, right? But you can live a long life, you know? But if it spreads to things like the liver, the pancreas and all that, then there is really no hope. Okay, any questions? So now I'm going, going to move into uh, what are called expression microarrays, or discussion of expression microarrays, all right? And again, the key idea here is we want to measure the activity of genes, okay? Because we are now slowly, I mean, there's a little bit of biology left, but we are slowly moving into the engineering arena, okay? Because now we have a reasonably good, at, le at least if you have been studying the nodes, the lectures and all that, you have a reasonably good understanding about the biological problem that is involved, right? And now we want to be able to use engineering techniques to do different things with biological data, right? And one of the topics uh, we're going to cover here uh, involves expression microarrays, right? Now, what is the key idea, right? See, like, when I covered the chapter on DNA structure, on DNA replication, right, you know that uh, I emphasize that DNA always occurs in nature as a double-stranded molecule, right? And then you also know that A always pairs with T, G pairs with C, right? And I also pointed out that if you have the, if you're looking for a particular DNA sequence, right, if you have the complement of that sequence, you can use that as a probe Right, because the complement is going to hybridize with that DNA sequence, so it form the double helix with great specificity. Right? Now, normally, I mean, see, prior to the mid-1990s, people were doing that one gene at a time. Okay. So if, you, if you're looking for, let's say, the gene for uh, sickle cell anemia, right, then you'll use the complement of that gene to look for that gene. Okay. So it's only one gene at a time. But if you're looking at the human genome, you probably have uh, you know, upwards of 20,000 genes. Right? So maybe you, you and see, the, the problem with that is that if you're looking only at one gene at a time, right, you say, okay, this is the gene that causes this cancer, right? The problem is that it's a multivariate effect, right? Just looking at that gene might not tell you the whole story, right? And, and that's a problem, and we know that. As electrical engineers, we use AND gates, okay? If you have an AND gate with 50 inputs, right? If you're looking at one gene, you think that caused it, that's not going to show any difference, okay? It's only when all the inputs are on, then you're going to have the output on, right? So that means multivariate effects are important. And if you look at traditionally how biologists have studied a lot of these biological phenomena, even in involving gene expression, it's basically like one or two genes, right, at a time. So they, they do not look at, you know, multiple genes and then, uh, you know, try to look for multivariate effects, right? So this expression microarray, it allows you to look at the expression 
of thousands of genes. Again, what is expression? What is gene expression? Transcription, yeah, mRNA, whether you have messenger RNA or not, right? So it allows you to look at the activity status of thousands of genes at the same time. How do you do that? It's similar to, you know, the integrated circuit, right? On a glass slide, right, maybe a, a couple of inches by a couple of inches, you have, uh, you know, printed spots where the complements of the genes that you're interested in, right, have been immobilized, okay? So the, so the probes are now there on a single chip, right? That's what the microarray is, right? And so now... If you, if you want to, you know, figure out which genes are, are being expressed in a particular uh, messenger RNA sample, right, you will go from there. You'll go from that sample, see where you can get things to hybridize. I'll spell out the details in a few minutes, all right, where you, you can get it to hybridize. Now, you'll probably, if, you, if you're looking at different samples, okay, you want to see which genes are differentially expressed, you will probably tag them with different colors, okay, the, the samples with different colors, and then you will take a picture, right, with a laser beam, you'll get images. From the images, you will try to see, okay, which are the genes which are differentially expressed between these two samples, right? That kind of stuff, right? So do you, do you get the big picture of the micro... So this is one technology, right? The microarray technology, and, and we'll talk about that. There is another technology which is... So using these microarrays, all right, you can, you can take the messenger RNA from, from a tissue, right, and find out uh, the intensity of uh, the amount of messenger RNA that is, that is being produced, that is going to be proportional to the intensity of the light that you get, right? Of course, assuming that you have accounted for all those experimental variations and all that, that's a, a separate area in its own right, right? But, so you can find out the activity status of the genes, right? Using microarrays, that's one technique. Another technique that people use, right? It is called next generation sequencing, right? And I won't cover that in detail, but if you work with us in the center, you'll see that that technique is used. What do you do in next generation sequencing? See, microarrays were developed around 1995, right, or 1997, right? At that time, it was very expensive to do the sequencing, right? So if you look at the 3 billion nucleotides, right, in the human genome, to sequence that, it took them, I think, 13 years and uh, three, billion, 3 or 4 billion dollars, okay? Now that procedure has been, and, and that's the kind of sequencing that I covered in this class. Right, the Sanger sequencing, remember, with the di-deoxy ribonucleotides? That's a laborious thing because you're going to do it three billion times, right, to get the entire sequence, right? One by one, one by one, you're going to figure it out. Today, what is done is instead of looking at all the three billion nucleotides together, right, you break it up into pieces, right? You break it up into pieces of, let's say, 100 units length each, right? And the cuts are random, right? So you do that many times, right? And the advantage is that now you're able to sequence much faster because it's only 100 units. You have lots of sequencing to do, but you can do that in parallel, right? And uh, so uh, the strategy today, all right, is to basically, in, instead of doing expression microarrays, you can still do that, but I'm saying instead of doing expression microarrays, what you're going to do is you're going to go and sequence the RNA, right? So they call that RNA sequencing, RNA-seq. So if you want to find out how much of RNA has been produced, okay, go ahead and you know, from that RNA, you, uh, you can get uh, complementary DNA, right? Because DNA is more stable, you probably get complementary DNA. And then from that uh, complementary DNA, you amplify that using PCR, right? Remember polymerase chain reaction? Amplify it many times, and then you figure out, right? You basically go ahead and sequence it, sequence your sample, right? So if you have more amount of, of particular messenger RNA, you will get more sequences uh, of that particular type. Right, so you're going to count that, right? And that is going to be a measure of the gene expression, right? So both these techniques, expression microarray and uh, RNA sequencing, you're really trying to, you know, uh, get a handle on the activity status of genes that you're interested in. And the, the expression microarray is for doing thousands of genes at the same time. Even with uh, RNA-seq, you can do the same thing. You're, you're going ahead and sequencing the entire RNA sequence, right, many, many times. Right, so that's the big, uh, big picture, right? And then I will cover the expression microarrays. I'll go through it step by step. There are two, uh, there are there are a couple of papers that I will cover. Okay, that'll have all the math detail and all that stuff, right? Here, you know, this these notes and even that book was written as, at a more elementary level, right? And then the data that you get from the microarrays, how do you analyze that data, right? You can use that data basically to do disease classification, right? So if you if you have, you know. You've looked at several microarrays, all right? Uh, getting uh, 
data from uh, normal tissue versus cancerous tissue, right? You've gone through several microarrays. The question is, is it possible to learn that so that when you get a new sample, right, you're going to be able to say whether it is cancerous or it's normal, right? That's disease classification, right? So you can do that, right? Then uh, you can do uh, something called clustering, right? Maybe you want to group together all the genes that go up and down together, right? So can you do clustering? Can you find patterns, right, in the data that you see from the microarrays? Then uh, you can also probably find out, let's say if there are some genes that go up and down together, maybe there's some relationship between them, right? Can you find out the, the relationships between the different genes? Because remember, one of the problems is that the biologists have, have looked only at one gene at a time, right? We want to be able to look at multiple genes, like if, if there's a gene here, okay, gene number one, okay, which are the other genes that are actually, uh, you know, contributing to its activity, right? That kind of thing. So we want to find out the, the, the uh, relationships between genes, right? So I think, and see the approach we are using here is looking at the, uh, ex let's say microarray data, right? But you want to do both, okay? You do not want to throw away the prior information, right? See, the, what the biologists have, it, it's not perfect, but they know that, okay, this gene responds to that other gene, okay? So they do have parts of the puzzle, right? So I'm saying that we probably should not start from scratch, right? Just because we are getting new data using expression microarrays, maybe we should come up with models that also can explain what the biologist is seeing, right? So the prior knowledge and the new data has to be incorporated together, okay? So that's going to be the general theme. And then I'm going to cover all these different bits and pieces. So let's get started with our discussion of expression microarrays today. Right? And I'll try to explain as we go, and I'll use a picture to do that. So as I said, cellular control results from multivariate activity. Again, the emphasis here is on multivariate activity among cohorts of genes and their products, right? Now, since all three levels in the central dogma, again, remember the central dogma of molecular biology, what does that state? Yeah, information flow is from DNA to RNA to protein, okay? So all three levels in the central dogma, DNA, RNA, and protein interact. It is not possible to fully separate them because we know that, you know, some protein, there's going to be a protein that is produced that is going to act as a transcription factor. So there is interaction and there are feedbacks, right, all throughout, right? So information from all these realms must be combined for full understanding. Right? Now the high level of interactivity between the levels ensures that a significant amount of the system information is available in each of the levels so that focus studies provide useful insights. Right. Now much of the current effort is focused at the RNA level. Why? Because we have microarrays. If you're going to do a study with proteins, what are you going to need? If you, so just like for the DNA, you need the complement, right? I mean, complementary DNA. That's easy to produce. What about the proteins? What are you going to need? If I'm going to look for a particular protein, what should I, what should I use? What binds to that protein with great, great specificity? Antibody, yeah. And so for all the proteins, the antibodies are not figured out, okay? Somebody has to figure out what that antibody is going to be, right? So that's not available, so that's more expensive, right? So most of the time, the effort is focused at the RNA level. Now, high-throughput technologies make it possible to simultaneously measure the RNA abundance of tens of thousands of messenger RNAs. In fact, the whole human genome, you can do it on a single single chip right now. Okay, there are companies like Affymetrix and others that have you know, basically put the whole the complement of, of the entire genome on a single chip, right? So you can measure that. And if there are any questions, just stop me, right? I'll... So expression microarrays result from a complex biochemical optical system incorporating robotic spotting and computer image formation. And these arrays are grids of thousands of different single-stranded DNA molecules attached to a surface to serve as probes, right? So basically the complement of the DNA that you'll be interested in. Now two major kinds of uh, microarrays are the ones using synthesized oligonucleotides. Again, I said before, an oligonucleotide is basically something that is artificially synthesized. It's a short nucleotide that is artificially synthesized. And on the other hand, you also have the option of using comp uh, sp uh, complementary DNAs, okay, as probes, right? Because you could take the messenger RNA from the tissue that you're interested in, from that generate the complementary DNA, right? And then use that as a probe on the, on, on the glass slide, right? So the basic uh, procedure is to extract RNA from cells, convert the RNA to single-stranded complementary DNA, right? Using what? What are you going to use to convert RNA to single-stranded complementary DNA? 
What enzyme are you going to use? Huh? No, RNA polymerase is not going to... RNA polymerase basically gives you RNA from DNA, right? Here you want to go to DNA from RNA. So what enzyme are you going to use? Good, yeah. So reverse transcriptase is going to be used. Then you'll allow the single-stranded complementary DNAs to hybridize to their complementary probes on the microarray and then detect the resulting floor-tagged hybrids via excitation of the attached floors and image formation using a scanning confocal microscope. Okay, again, I mean, there are a lot of biological details, but we as engineers, we are interested in the final data that you get and how to analyze that data. So let me go to this picture, okay? This picture is, is from a paper that was written in 1997, and, uh, you know, two of the co-authors are here at A&M right now. Okay, this is the first paper on the image analysis of cDNA microarrays. Right. Um, so what is the procedure involved? So, so first you have to prepare the microarray, right? So you have these spots, right, on, the, on this glass slide, right? So at each location, you're going to immobilize the complement of a, of a gene that you're interested in. Okay, so you could, uh, I mean, you could either take synthetic DNA, oligonucleotide, right, or you could take complementary DNA. How? You have messenger RNA from a tissue, right? From that, you get, you basically use reverse transcriptase to get the complementary DNA, right, and get the genes, right? Basically, immobilize them on this surface. So those are the probes that you're going to use later on. Okay, so this is the microarray preparation. Now, this, so. So, uh, and, and this, for, for these steps, all right, you have robots that, that could go and, and, and do that printing, right? So they'll go from one location to the next and all that. So now, again, the robot is not going to do a perfect job, right? So the location of these uh, spots on the slide may not be known perfectly. So you'll have to figure that out from analyzing the image that you get later. So then you have all these complements waiting here, the complementary probes. Now what you can do is, let's say I'm interested in, in analyzing the differential expression between two samples, okay? Let's say normal tissue versus cancerous tissue. I want to see which are the genes that differ between the two of them. So I can take the infected cells, all right? And then these are the uninfected cells. So let's say this is cancerous, this is normal, right? I'll do reverse transcription. So th here, fr from those cells, I'm g I've gotten the messenger RNA, right? So I'm going to do reverse transcription. So I'll get the complementary DNA. While I'm doing that reverse transcription, I will add some color, okay? Because I want to be able to differentiate between the gene expression here versus the gene expression here. So maybe one of them I'll cover, uh, I'll color green, the other one I'll color red, right? And there are dyes that have uh, names like Psi3 and Psi5. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, each of these samples that have been colored, right? I'm, I'm sorry, the complementary DNA, and I'm going to basically uh, rub it onto, onto this. At each location, I'm going to rub it in, right? To, so if, if the complement is there, then hybridization will take place. And of course, I have to make sure that the probe is in excess, all right? I have to make sure that I have enough complementary DNA over here that can capture all the, uh, you know, uh, floor tag uh, DNAs that I'm trying to get to hybridize, okay? Otherwise, the result is going to be wrong, right? So I do that. So wherever there is a match, there'll be a double helix that will be formed, right? So wherever there is no hybridization, I will get rid of those, of those um, DNAs. How? Just by washing this, right? Wash it so only the, doubles, only the double helix is going to remain, right? And now I, I will have basically at different locations, all right, at different spots on this slide, I will have green complementary DNA and red complementary DNA hybridized to different extents, right? So now I shine a light on this through a laser, both green and, and, and red, right? And I get two images here. Right, again, there are details of how, you know, what intensity the laser will be and things like that. That part the biologist will do in the lab. But at the end of the day, I get these two kinds of images, right? One is red, one is green, right? So if at a particular location, the green is, is brighter than the red, that means the messenger RNA corresponding to the green sample is higher, so that gene is expressed at a higher level than the red, right? So at each, each spot here, right, once I have this, these two images, now the double E stuff has already started, right? Not my area of expertise, I'm not an image analysis person. But you have to analyze this image, right, that is red, the red image and the green image, and figure out which are the genes which are differentially expressed, right? So the, the question you will ask at each spot is, is the red the same intensity as green, right? Is the red less than the green? 
Is the red more than the green? Okay, so you can say, is red over green equal to 1? Red over green greater than 1? Red over green less than 1? Right, the ratio, right? You cannot do an exact thing by just putting it at 1, right? You will have to, put, because there is randomness associated with all this stuff, right? So you will have to do some kind of hypothesis testing, right? So there, there are like two distributions. I will do, I'll cover all those things in detail, but there are two distributions, all right? There is some overlapping region, right, between the two distributions, and you want to make a call about whether it belongs to one distribution versus the other, right? Red greater than green, red less than green, red equal to green, right? So that, this is going to require statistics, and it is also going to require image processing, right? So I will discuss the, pa the paper from which this image has been taken. I will discuss that in detail, right? I think that's one paper we need to discuss in detail. Right, even outside the, the purview of these notes and these lectures, I will discuss that. Okay. Because you're engineering students, so the engineering part should be discussed. And, and this kind of stuff, this has nothing to do with animal biology. Right? Even for plant, in plant genomics also, you could do the same kind of microarrays. Right? And then try to see you know, which genes are differentially expressed. So what I'm teaching you here will have applications both in, in uh, let's say, cancer right? or animal genomics, as well as in plant genomics. Right? Now, so... Again, I mean, before getting back to this topic of microarrays, what are you going to do with this data? So let's say I figured out a statistical procedure where at every spot, okay, at every spot, I will say if red is greater than green, it is a 1, right? Red equal to green is 0. Red less than green, it is minus 1, right? So for every spot using this procedure, using this engineering procedure, right, I will be having a number 1, 0, minus 1, and so on, okay? Now, I can do this over several samples, right? Then the th thing is, Okay, now later on, so I have, so there are patterns, there are d these patterns, okay, and I'm going to try to de design a, a device called a classifier, right? So that classifier is going to be trained based on these samples that I'm giving it. Once it has been trained, right, I want it to be able to look at a new sample, right, and tell me, okay, is this cancer or is this normal, right? Can it put it in a category, right? That's the classification problem. Again, an engineering thing, it has nothing to do with biology, right? It's going to be used in an engineering application, right? The problem here is that, you know, the problem with this, and I should point that out, the problem with this is that on these slides, you might have like 10,000 genes, okay? And samples might be 100, right? So uh, you have a problem, uh, I mean, all these law of large numbers and all those things will not apply. All those asymptotic results are not going to apply, right? Because the number, you, you have a very large number of variables, right? And you want to do classification based on very small number of samples, all right? So you'll run, it, run into problems. So the question is, um, I mean, how, how do you handle that? Okay. So, so, so that, that's going to be a real problem. Okay? And, and there, there are you know, research issues associated with that. And you also want to know that if I design such a classifier, right, when I test it on a new sample, what is the probability of it making mistakes? Okay? The probability of misclassification, you want to quantify that. Right? You, you, you want to be able to estimate the error, how good the classifier is. Okay. Um, so then, uh, let's say that step has been done. Right? I, I'm pointing out the difficulties that you will have in that step. Let's say that step has been done and you have these numbers 1, 0, minus 1, and so on. Okay? Now, the question is, using this data, right? I, so can I do classification number 1? Can I do clustering? Can I group together genes whose expressions across these different uh, samples okay, go up and down together? Maybe there's some relationship between them. So I'll cover clustering, all right? Then I will do what is called expression prediction, which basically means that looking at gene number five and six, all right, can I predict something about what is going to happen to gene number one? So try to find out the relationship between the genes, right? So gene number five and six, maybe they affect gene number one in this way, all right? So can I find that out from the data? And I think here you need a mix between the data and whatever prior information is available, all right? Then the next thing is to, and again, this is more like, uh, what should I say? It is like theory or Star Wars or whatever, okay? Because it's not at that stage where you can actually say for sure that you know this is going to work in the real world. So let's say you found a relationship between the different genes on the on the microarray, right? So you could construct a network, right? It's like having many variables that are interacting with each other, and is it possible to use that that network to model the behavior of the cancer, right? And probably you know try to cure it, like move the move the state of the network from an undesirable location to a desirable location, right, through therapy, right? Of course, there is a big, uh, you know, big gap here because we have to be sure that that network is the one that accurately mimics what is going on in the cell, right? 
And, and these things are open problems right now, but this is the direction that we are going to take. Right? So the engineering part, I mean, thanks to all of you for patiently learning the biology, but the engineering part is coming, okay? And that is going to take up the next several weeks, right? Before I switch gears and go into plant biology. And plant biology will be easier than the animal biology that you, we covered. A lot of things about the cell, transcription, translation, all those things are exactly the same, right? There are additional things that I will put in, okay? But it'll be easier because when you started out with the, with the uh, you know, initial molecular biology, you knew nothing about it. That was all Greek to you. But right now you know about transcription, okay? You know about transcription factors, right? You know about DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, and so those things we don't have to learn from scratch. So don't, in other words, don't go ahead and erase your memory completely, okay? You start, I know you studied for the exam, don't put an eraser and make it perfect, because then you'll have trouble when I do the plant biology. So even as you're studying for exam number two, keep, uh, you know, brushing up the on exam number one material also, because that will help you when we start talking about plant biology. Right. So any, any questions so far? So you can see from this, from this uh, microarray flow chart, okay, that engineering is going to come in, into the picture in major ways. There, there, are there are going to be pattern recognition problems, control problems, and so on, right? That will come up here, right? But a lot of it is, you know, it's like kind of futuristic because, I mean, I mean the classification still, some of it has been done, but the control and all that, whether it really, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating thereof, okay? Whether it actually cures the cancer or makes it more manageable, okay? That is going to be the ultimate test, right? Not if on paper you can, uh, you, can sh you know, do some simulation and show that something is working, right? And here the difficulty is that the model you're trying to come up with is for a system that we engineers have not designed. We did not design the cell. Right? We are getting these snapshots and we are trying to make an informed decision you know, about, uh, or come up with a, some model that is going to uh, help us uh, explain the behavior. Any questions? So this is the big picture. Right? And uh, let me just run through the rest of the... So if you're looking for RNA abundance, that is measured via measurement of signal intensity from the attached floors. Because I, remember I said that from the RNA, you're going to create complementary DNA and you're going to tag it with the right color, okay? So this intensity is obtained by image processing and statistical analysis. So again, double E topics, right? We're back to double E topics. So particular attention is paid to the detection of high or low expressing genes and beyond that to expression-based phenotype classification. That's what I talked about, whether cancer or no cancer. Or is it stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, right? Can you construct a classifier? And to the discovery of multivariate intergene predictive relationships. So here we briefly discuss microarrays, the hybridization-based foundation, which I explained in the picture. Then normalization and ratio analysis I'll talk about later, right? Ratio analysis is going to be that paper that I mentioned. I said I'll discuss the paper in detail. That's ratio analysis. Normalization means, like, see, here you have a red channel and a green channel, okay? Maybe the red dye is better at, uh, you know, uh, binding, let's say, to, onto the DNA and things like that. So you have to do normalization because there, it could be that there is a bias between the two channels, okay? You're looking at red intensity equal to green intensity. Maybe the red is twice as efficient, okay? So you should multiply the green intensity by two before you do the comparison, okay? That kind of thing. So the principle behind cDNA spotted arrays is that an mRNA transcript to be detected is copied into a complementary DNA, cDNA, and this copied form of the transcript is immobilized on a glass microscope slide, as I explained before, right? Preparation of the microarray. The slides are usually coated with polylysine or polyamine to immobilize the DNA molecules on the surface. Again, these are just details, right? Now, for robotic spotting, the robot would dip its pin into solutions that contain the complementary DNA, and then the, uh, the tiny amounts of solution that adhere to the pins are transferred to the surface. Each pin produces a printed spot containing complementary DNA. Right? Another method used inkjet printing, in which the cDNA is expelled from a small nozzle that is equipped with a piezoelectric fitting by applying electric current. So a complete cDNA microarray is prepared by printing thousands of cDNAs in an array format on the glass slide, and these provide gene-specific hybridization targets. And a schematic representation of the preparation, hybridization, image acquisition, and analysis of cDNA microarrays is shown in the figure that I showed you, right? This figure, right, that I discussed. 
A digital image reflecting the abundance of different messenger RNAs in a sample is formed in a number of steps. Number one, RNA is extracted from the cells of interest, converted to complementary DNA by reverse transcription, and then amplified. Uh, uh, and, and then amplified using PCR. So you have reverse transcription followed by PCR because you need to increase the amount of DNA that you have to run out of these procedures. All right. So during the process, fluorescent molecules are attached to the DNA. And if a specific messenger RNA is, uh, molecule is produced by the cells, then the generated fluorescently labeled cDNA molecule will hybridize to its complementary single-stranded microarray probe. All right. And all of this stuff I already explained. Now, the cDNA molecules, which do not find their complementary single-stranded DNA sequences on the microarray, they are removed in a washing step. You just wash them off. <coughs> Since the fluorescent tags are attached to the cDNA strands that hybridize, the corresponding spots will fluoresce when provided fluorescence excitation energy and be detected at the level of emitted light. All right, so you'll use either a green laser or a red laser. Right. This yields a digital image whose intensities reflect levels of measured fluorescence which in turn reflect uh, the abundances of the messenger RNAs. So in practice, it is commonplace to label messenger RNA molecules from distinct sources with different fluorescent tags and then co-hybridize them onto each array gene. That's what I, I told you, that on each spot, you're going to mix up the two samples. And two monochrome images, that means the images of the same color, are obtained from laser excitations at two different wavelengths, red and green. Okay? And monochrome images of the intensity for each fluorescent label are combined by placing each image in the appropriate color channel of an RGB image, right? red, green, blue image. Again, I mean, people who are familiar with image processing will know what, what is involved in that. You know, I'm not an expert in that. So in this composite image, one can visualize the differential expression of genes in the two cells, right? Uh, in the two cell types, the test sample typically being placed in the red channel with the reference sample in the green channel, right? So if there is intense red fluorescent at a, at a spot, it indicates a high level of expression of that gene in the test sample, right, relative to the reference sample and vice versa, right. So when both test and reference samples exp express a gene at similar levels, the observed array spot is yellow. And that's where you need the statistical techniques, okay, because you have to make a call, okay, which one is higher or are they about the same, right. So assuming that specific DNA products from two samples have an equal probability of hybridizing, there are a lot of assumptions here, they have an equal probability of hybridizing to the specific target the fluorescent intensity measurement is a function of the amount of specific RNA available within each sample, right? Uh, provided uh, samples are well mixed, samples have to be well mixed, and there is, has to be sufficient CNA dep uh, cDNA deposited at each target location because you have to, the, the probe has to be in excess so that all the, uh, you know, complementary DNA of those two different colors gets a chance to hybridize, right? Ratios or direct intensity measurements of gene expression levels between the samples can be used to detect meaningfully different expression levels between the samples for a given gene. Right. Now, there are several image processing steps, right? When you're using cDNA microarrays, the signal must be extracted from the background, right? You have that image, you have to extract the And remember, the spots also, although they are uniformly distributed, when the robot moves around, it'll mess up, all right? So you have to make sure you're picking up the right signal. So this requires the image processing to extract signals, variability analysis, and measurement quality assessment. And the objective of the microarray image analysis is to ex extract probe intensities or ratios at each cDNA target location and then cross-link printed clone information so that biologists can easily interpret the outcomes and high-level analysis can be performed. So a microarray image is first segmented into individual cDNA targets. Because remember, at each spot, you at each spot, you know, you have something that is hybridized red or green, okay? So you have to basically identify each spot in that image. So you have to do some segmentation. And uh, for each target, the surrounding background intensity is estimated along with the exact target location, fluorescent intensity and expression ratios. All these things are discussed in detail in the paper that I will be taking up for discussion. I'm not sure whether I'll do it in the next class or a little bit later, right? Finish up the, these notes, all right? And, and then discuss those papers in, in detail. Okay, I think it's almost time. So I think let's stop here for today. This is a good place to stop, right? And I'll continue from here next time, right? Are there any questions?